Welcome back, everyone. So this is our last talk of the day. Following this will be the panel, which if you want to get any questions in, you've probably got another 20 minutes or so before uh, we will miss them anyway. Um, but there's all signs around at the doors that tell you how to submit any. But for now, we have uh, a talk on getting people engaged with Tennessee. So uh, please welcome him. Thanks, Paul. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm aware there's a talk on next door on how to interface, uh, do brain-computer interfacing with Python, so the fact that anyone is here at all I count as a major win. Okay, so these are some of my worst slides, but some of my best content. Um, in addition, this is the second time I've given the talk, and at about 10 o'clock last night I became convinced I needed to rewrite the entire thing, and I did. So uh, what it shows is that I really care about what's in it, uh, but it does mean that the slide uh, presentation has suffered slightly in the passion and enthusiasm for communicating the, uh, the correct information. So focus on the data, not the content. So I don't have all the answers. Nothing is easy. Only some of what I try ends up working out. Uh, I want to acknowledge that in some environments you can't change things. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, effort in recognising when to push uh, and when to wait. But none of that has stopped me from having an opinion. Uh, and so here they are. Uh, this isn't about any organisation or employer. Uh, it's gathered from like multiple places I've worked, many, many people I've talked to. I've never met anyone who doesn't have problems in this area uh, slash opportunities in this area. So it really is a, a universal uh, set of data that I've drawn on in bringing this together. Um, and for anyone who is uh, copyright oriented, uh, all of the images come from Pixabay except for one under a free license that doesn't require attribution, which seems weird, but there you have it. So I'm going to start by talking about big achievements in general. Okay, so these aren't necessarily software security examples, but they're just kind of generally awesome. How does a generally awesome thing happen at all is kind of where I want to start with. So let's talk about one. Someone managed to get 80% plus test coverage in a large legacy application that started life with no tests, added a three month delay to a massive project despite major objections from the business and others on the team. How does someone do that? That doesn't normally happen when I face that much objection. How did they manage to pull that off? Yeah. Other examples, uh, organising a new team, establishing anything, getting anything over the line is incredibly hard. Who's actually tried recently to try to convince anybody else of anything at all that they didn't believe in beforehand? Okay. The, this is the essence of the challenge I'm really trying to get at. So let's think for a minute about our own experience. When was a time you really committed and just went all in on something? Why did you commit? Did someone tell you to? Did you read something? I'm willing to bet that it's because you decided for yourself that it was worth it. You, d you didn't, you know, perhaps someone else incepted the idea in you, instigated it, recommended it, tasked you with, etc. But I'm willing that the commitment came from your decision. And I'm willing to bet that if that's what happened for you, it's probably what happens for other people as well. The rest of the talk is just footnotes. We're done. Okay. Well. We're not done. Actually, this is like planning a heist, getting somebody on board with something. You're going to need a team. It's not something you can do alone. And just to be really clear, these people don't work for you. You're going to need an objective. It's complex. And as the hero of the story, you're going to need to pull it together. You're going to need to start by understanding where you are, who else is involved, what their interests and motivations are, and how to get them to take an interest you probably won't have much time left to code. OK, it's like a game of chess. It's going to take time, and there's a lot of moves. So what does this have to do specifically with software security? Well, in a way, nothing. OK, there's this penny drop moment where you realise that if you've got the right people strategy, the technical strategy will emerge from those people. If you get the right people involved and motivated in whatever it is you want to achieve, you don't necessarily need to solve the problem anymore. And the way to start working on what those other people are thinking about is start with the easy wins. Who's been told to start with an easy win before? Yes? Oh, hey, hey. And, and people are happy to put up hands at the same time. So half of the room has heard that they should start with an easy win and is willing to put up their hand, which means that the whole room has actually heard start with the easy win. <laughs> okay. So 
Big things are just little things start to get it. This is why people tell you to. But it took me actually quite a long time to figure out why people kept saying start with the easy wins. And no one would ever break it down for me. So what when they say start with the easy wins, might they really be might they really mean? And I really wish someone had just like broken this out for me. So this is one of my two busy, two small font busy slides, but it really does talk about what I think is at the essence of thinking about how to make progress with groups of people. So first up, uh, my mind always starts with the unstated concerns. If someone says start on the easy wins, I'm like, okay, you're not buying what I'm selling. I've heard you. Okay, so they might not have much interest. They might not be sure I can do it. They don't understand what I'm driving at or they basically just have no idea what I'm talking about and why they might want to do it. Often, that signifies some kind of awareness problem. On the other hand, there are real benefits for starting with easy wins. And I used to think what they meant was, do the easy win and then I'll buy in. But it turns out there's still a lot of work left after you've actually got the easy win over the line. The easy win does not, in fact, lead to profit. The easy win leads to more work. The more work is you've got something to talk about. You can demonstrate your ability to plan and scope work. You can demonstrate your ability to deliver. Actually getting something done is more useful than doing nothing, and it's easier to get approved. So the next step is the leverage. So how leverage actually works is going to be about the individual motivations of the people that you're talking to and you're working with. In a technical audience, it may be enough to explain technically how your solution leads to a greater outcome, if the people are already broadly speaking on board with it and broadly speaking technical. A simple explanation of, if we do this, we will reduce the number of errors, go. Okay, they may already be invested in that particular outcome, but they may not. You may need to go to meetings, present slides, have opportunities for little learnings. It's a little bit uh, uh, pithy to call them little learnings, but if people don't have the time to wrap their heads around exactly what you're after, do it in little bite-sized chunks. Take your early win, explain that to that to them, and realise that you're playing a chess game with many moves, and if it takes a few moves to get someone over the line, that's not a problem. Prove value. Concentrate on small but real business value to get the attention, and just create buzz, awareness, excitement, something you can talk about in the corridor. Next time you see that person or that person's manager in a corridor, you're not going to just say, hey, how was the footy on the weekend? You're going to say, how about that easy win that I got over the line? Wasn't that neat? Okay, easy wins in practice. Break it down for people. Early goals need to be very clearly defined. Things that aren't clearly defined turn out not to be achievable, or once achieved, turn out not to be recognised. So, here's an example of an easy win. Turning on static analysis just for the SQL handling code. What's the problem or opportunity by this easy win? Well, people keep picking up user input vulnerabilities during final testing. That's what the problem is. This takes time and money and could be easily avoided. I personally approach this problem differently, which is it just bugs me aesthetically, but that doesn't really convince other people very well. So what's involved? Install a tool. Configure it just for the exact thing you want it to do. Even if your tool is you know, capable of far more, right? Don't try to sell, sell people the whole, you know, the whole meal straight away. Just concentrate on those simple things. Add it to the build pipeline. Never forget to actually make an actual list of who's involved. I don't mean think about who's involved and then forget about it. I mean write down actual piece of paper, Trello card, however you keep notes. Make that list. Explain to the people around you you've thought about all of those different perspectives when you thought about the requirements and how to solve the problem. If possible, specific value. Uh, you're going to have reduced rework, reduced overall time to deliver. Some people may care about the specific value. They'll just be pleased that you've thought about the concrete outcomes of your work. Runs on the board matter. So, first of all, I love cricket. I haven't watched it for many years, but I wasted much of my post-university career watching cricket. Secondly, this is how a lot of people are going to see what you do. You're out there in the middle trying to score more runs, try, trying to improve the way you code, try to improve the way the team codes. A lot of the people you need to convince are just going to be out on the margins, just watching the game. You know, they're not going to be too fussed what kind of bat you've got. They're not really going to be too fussed on your tactics. You need to talk to them about the runs on the board. They're interested in the bigger picture. So, runs on the board. Again, breaking out, the, breaking out what this actually means. So, what's the problem or opportunity for getting runs on the board? People aren't aware of the importance of the issues you're trying to convince them of. It really doesn't matter at this point whether you're talking to a technical person or a non-technical person. What matters is that they're not aware, okay? 
or possibly they have other priorities. But to start with, they're not aware. They don't understand how it's going to contribute value. They don't seem to prioritise your work, and they don't support your decisions. It could be a lack of awareness on your part of their priorities, but it could equally be a lack of awareness on their part. So really, the runs on the board start to help them understand that you create value by doing what you're doing. Get a few achievable things done. Explain what can be achieved, who it benefits and how. Show the importance of the work by explaining value. So who's involved? Your manager, other advocates who care. Uh, also people who are involved are the detractors who are con uh, concerned about the cost, the effort or the approach. So you may not be able to exactly win them, on, win them over, but they're most certainly involved. And they'll be out there doing things uh, in your organisation or in your life whether or not uh, you're aware of it. So include them on the list too. So what's the specific value? You may spend less time frustrated at the fact your ideas don't get up. You might find it a little easier to have conversations with the people around you about why you're doing what you're doing. You're more likely to actually achieve the, the benefits realisation from your proposal. So instead of spending so much time arguing for your idea, you'll spend a little bit more time doing the idea. Less time wasted. Okay. An overnight success, years in the making. So building momentum. What's the problem or, or opportunity around momentum? So suppose you've managed to convince someone, maybe you're, if you're sitting there in a development role by yourself, you might be able to just carve out enough of your time to start making some progress and people start seeing it. If you're trying to get a whole team on board, perhaps what's going on is you've managed to get one sprint you know, where they've included, folded a few uh, you know, fixing goals into their sprint, maybe they've done some threat modelling, maybe they've closed a few bugs, whatever it is. But the problem if you don't have momentum is that you need to keep re-arguing that same case. You're stuck back on day one saying, hey, can we close them bugs? I'm still, ma still making the same arguments as last time. Leads to pushback and change resistance. Maybe there was a window where they were open to it, but their priorities have shifted now. You've got to re-pitch your ideas. You're still somehow not making enough progress. So what's involved? Getting people accustomed to what you're doing and why. Literally just getting them used to it. Getting people to want to share in your success and be a part of it. If you're starting to get runs on the board with your manager, with the team, with whoever it is that's starting to listen to you, other people are going to start to want that thing too. They're going to want that same recognition you've managed to achieve. And you should let them have it. So who's involved? Your manager, approvers and supporters, detractors once again. Need to understand the negative messaging that's coming back as well. So the specific value is that other people start advocating for your proposal and approach. Other people are in meetings going, we should do that thing that this person wants to, wants to do. Other people are starting to solve your problems for you. The more momentum you've got and the more people buy into what you're doing, the more people are on your side whether you know it or not helping you solve problems. So there's more time spent on benefits realisation compared to advocacy and that advocacy is more effective through greater diversity. So we'll get by with a little help from our friends. Sponsors, advocates and allies. So what's the problem or opportunity? You can't be in every meeting, you won't have the authority in every context, and you can't see all the meetings. This one has really particularly jumped out at me when I've been thinking more recently about diversity. I used to very much believe, and honestly I still do, that the best way to solve a technical problem is to have one person, one human mind, that loads in all of the factors so they can understand all the trades and balances and see the whole picture and then they're going to be able to really effectively come up with a solution that understands all the trade-offs involved. And I still think that's incredibly valued, uh, valuable and undervalued in general. But there's going to be blind spots with that. You're going to need other people to help you. And if you spend all of the time coming up with your own ideas, other people aren't necessarily going to be on board either. And the modern software engineering environment is more, than, more often than not a team. It, it's, it's much less common now to have uh, individual major applications built by you know, just one or two people. It's much more common to have at least four people, probably around eight, if you include what I call the wider immediate team, which includes project managers, customers, you, you know, your supervisor, etc. Really, you've got to be thinking about these dynamics. So, Who's involved? Getting a little repetitive now, but you know, it never hurts because rep repetition helps people simply remember what you have to say. Actually just helping people remember that you exist and what you're trying to achieve is a pretty big part of the battle. So specific values, the outcome becomes a priority for other people. And that's really the tipping point is where it's not all on you anymore. 
the energy being added to the system doesn't have to come from you anymore, and it starts coming from other people. It becomes bigger than one person's initiative. Larger pieces of work become possible. Something that seemed impossible at the outset in terms of scale or ambition becomes much more achievable. Okay. Decisions get made all the time. Your job is to figure out where and how. So, reporting, storytelling, and messaging. This is how you connect with decision making. If you're in the room, you can argue for something. But if you're not in the room, you're going to have to have something to carry your message for you. And that's why you need to go down this path, whether you like it or not. Some people enjoy this. It may seem non-technical. Someone's going to have to do it. A lot of people certainly don't like boring things. I don't think any developers like boring things. It's the same for your manager. So people just switch off. So you have to have compelling storytelling. Some people need things served their way. A business person might need it expressed in business terms, outcomes they can understand or value from the customer, so you might have to learn something completely foreign to your development goals if you've taken the time to really understand if there's a key person who you need to convince from a decision-making perspective, you're going to have to go this way. Uh, people might not, you might not be connected with how other people are making decisions. People might just forget what you said. Uh, so you need to understand key reporting if you're in a major organisation. Uh, understand and obtain examples of reporting from others can be quite powerful um, and create a narrative that people can understand. Okay. So make sure you know what outcomes you can attribute even directly to your, indirectly to your efforts. This is something where people like, might potentially stop. They don't know how to connect what they're doing all the way in terms of value, in terms of what other people have to do. So know your basic frameworks, momentum and buzz, charts and infographics. So this presentation so far has not been a great example of any of this. This presentation has been quite dry. I've told you what to do, but I haven't really led by example. Uh, if I have time, I'll do so later. OK. Oh, I've got time. I'll do it now. OK. So I'm going to switch into storytelling mode. This was the talk as I originally conceived it, and you now have my original talk pre-rewrite. I used to be a developer. I have actually stopped calling myself a developer. I loved being a developer. I would go onto the mountain and I would climb that mountain and I would fix the problem and it was good and it was sunny and I loved it. And then somebody showed me information security. <laughs> and then I felt a little different. So I thought, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to take that lying down. I'm going to think this through. I'm going to figure out what we need. I'm going to figure out what this solution is. We need all of this right now, or we're stuffed. We need automated analysis, SAST and DAST and formal methods and autosploit and penetration, penetration testing labs, hand code review and two pairs of eyes and knowledge transfer. And I went and I took this list and all of my passion and all of my thoughts and I took it back to the team and they just thought I was a crazy person. And then everyone else just went. I'd seen, I'd seen the, the I, I had bought in, right? Like I, I'd got there, I had my commitment, I was interested, I was interested in the problems, I wanted to solve them, but I hadn't taken the time to get people on board. And that's where I started on the journey that's ended me up here today. I sat and I thought, well, okay, who specifically was I trying to convince and why didn't they? This was not an easy process for me, this was fairly painful, I might add. Expect pain, right? Not, not awful pain, but the pain of non-comprehension, the pain of not getting buy-in, the pain of having to give up on time spent on technical work or on having to have difficult conversations or do whatever it is that involves relating to your, to your fellow man or making the time for it in your day. So expect it to be a challenge. But this is what you want, right? You don't want to be the person alone in the parking lot. You actually need the team. If you really what you care about is the outcome, not specifically your role in it, but care more about getting there than you do about your role, you'll care about the team. So how do people work? It's not like that. I mean, it's a little bit like that, but it's definitely not only like that. It's much more like this. We have huge numbers of people, and they're all varied uh, and different and individually distinct and valuable. And that's what the diversity really means to me. Level. Level naught of diversity is like tolerance, like I'm willing to ignore the fact that you're different, okay? Level two is like, oh, I'm actually willing to really treasure the fact you're different. The, the next level is I'm actually going to pay attention to specifically how you're different and really understand that and learn that about you and then relate to you in a way that works uh, and creates a constructive relationship between the two of us or the group of us. And for me, that's how you, how you actually start to do this. Have I, 
people are waving signs. Are they my signs or are you just wiggling your signs? Ten minutes. Okay, they were wiggling the signs. I apologise. You can cut it out in post. All right, so <laughs> big things are just little things stuck together, right? So I said that before. So the people strategy is much more important than the technical strategy. So it's entirely possible I've lost a fraction of the room that was here for the technical strategy. If I have time for the third version of this talk right, right at the end, I have some technical strategy components plus that list I had earlier. But if you have the people strategy, particularly if you have technical people in your people strategy, you don't need the technical strategy because the people will come up with your technical strategy. It's a wonderful referential loop and it's very powerful. So, if you have the right people on board and enough of them on board and you've understood their diversity and what makes them tick and all of that, you can actually let go of that sense of needing control over the technical strategy. You can let go a little bit of that sense of needing control over we need this specific product immediately because of these gaps in how you know, tool A misses some of the SQL injections or that firewall doesn't do its WAF as well as that other firewall because you'll actually have the right people and the team will start to create the problems. No, solve the problems. <laughs> okay. So you need to identify early wins that others can, can achieve. You need to create an environment by which those other people start to be able to make those achievements. They'll learn and solve those problems. Once the momentum is there, you're all good, right? Once the momentum is there and the drive is there and the understanding of the need to, to, to get the objective, to a degree, you're done, right? That's the problem that this talk is trying, trying to deal with, is how do you get the people on, on board to solve these problems? Okay. Build awareness, familiarity, and motivation. Give people actions they can take, even if they only solve small parts of the problem. Get them empowered. Give people reasons they can understand easily, even if they don't understand the full picture. You understand the full picture, it's fine. You think you understand the full picture, actually you understand what you can see of the full picture. So accept that everybody's going to have a knowledge gap. Accept that change is always hard and usually slow. OK, so we've made it to the third presentation. So some examples of specific actionable things people can do. So simple things, right? Add security criteria to job advertisements for, de for developers. That's probably reasonably achievable in most organizations. You know, you're not necessarily going to you know, require everyone to have a really specific certification or a specific level. But what this is going to do is it's going to make your HR department ask for it. It's going to make a job applicant think about it at least once. It's going to make the hiring manager think about it at least once. And it's going to be an easy win. And you're going to be able to talk about it. Uh, chase up the resolution of security issues with the development teams. Uh, not everybody does this. Don't just tick and flick a, a ticket, create a ticket. You know, go talk to them about it. Send people outside your bubble to a security conference or event. Run a community of practice. Don't give anyone admin or commit privileges until they've clocked over the wire. Uh, that's a relatively simple thing. Most technical people should be able to get through a few of the over, over the wire exercises in a reasonably efficient time frame, to be honest. Uh, purchase some products that help people learn. Uh, I'm not big on product endorsements, feel free to ask me later, but there are lots of options. Uh, add badges, make people feel a sense of reward when they achieve these things. Uh, Slack integrations for, for the same kind of thing. So there's some specific things. What can we do as a room full of people? Let, let's forget about just, what, just uh, you know, back at home. Company boundaries are as porous and imaginary as firewall boundaries. State boundaries and cultural boundaries, also just as, we, as real. So, we could all connect up on LinkedIn. We could all go for drinks together. We could all post together on Twitter and LinkedIn about things we think are important and take advantage of the network effect. I suspect we won't, but we could. Connect to each other's companies and invite each other in to come and give presentations. It's a very well-known effect called the halo effect. Outsiders are seen as being objective, perhaps having more contemporary knowledge. Uh, and, it's a sp and there's some festivity to the occasion. There's a ceremony, there's an invitation, there's a meeting, there's someone from inside. Everyone has to, from outside, you need to impress people who are coming in externally so you all need to pay attention or be seen to pay attention. So we could just do that, right? Like we've all got businesses and email addresses. We could all just start inviting each other in for presentations. It'd probably go pretty well. Email a colleague's boss, find someone who does something good and then recommend that they would be a good choice for some further discussion on a topic of your choice. There's ways of engaging with people. Some of th these things may not seem as technical as perhaps some of us are useful, but they're all very powerful. 
And once you start with that people approach, they'll start to worry about the technical approach for themselves. Then you might have to have a technical discussion with them about what's actually right. So how do we deal with this particular problem? Okay, so we've all discussed how do we actually really get in, get in front of people and deal with people's, the fact that they're busy, right? I'm, I'm not gonna go around worrying about ma malicious motivations here. People are incredibly busy in their lives. They've all got entirely legitimate things uh, and they may perceive your problem as a distraction. There's basically two strategies. One, maybe you have to make some noise. If you're not comfortable with that, there's the one that I prefer. You could be a weed. Weeds don't give up. Weeds grow everywhere. Weeds get things done. So my preference is be a weed. Okay, so here's the fourth presentation. So how do you convince developers? Okay, show them things which cannot be unseen. That is essentially what worked for me. Talk to them about uh, professional responsibility, but uh, noblesse oblige never really worked that well. All of the other things I mentioned on the people side of things. If you need to, don't shy away of setting up your own parallel security testing infrastructure. How do you enable developers? Give them time, get their managers on board, give them skills. If you haven't noticed, I'm running out of time. Help them deal with their obstacles. How do you convince managers? Sound like you're across absolutely everything. Get to know the names and roles of everyone involved. Know the developers, managers, architects, operations team, security team, and all of the members. Have all of the key facts at your disposal and keep them simple. Talk about reduced costs, but basically, just look like you've thought about this more than anyone's ever thought about this before and you are across it. How do you enable managers? Never leave them in apology mode, never leave them ignorant, and never be wrong. Sweat the small stuff. Don't talk about how long it takes or how much effort, much effort is involved. That's a bit like the people technical strategy thing. It sounds ridiculous, but actually you want them to care before you want them to act. It's gonna be much more powerful that way around and then they will start solving that problem on their own. Okay, conclusions. Focus on what you can do, not on what you can't. People will come up with their own solutions if they're motivated and enabled. Uh, big things, just little things put together. Uh, support is just teamwork and buy-in. Thank you for my four presentations worth of time. Thank you, Tennessee. And uh we apologise for being really bad with the signs telling you where time is going. <laughs> uh, which means if we can run a track, any of you can run a track as well. <laughs> we do have a couple minutes for questions, so if anyone has any, uh, please let me know. Um, I just wasn't sure how to interpret the um, uh, don't be wrong with the manager thing on the one or two slides back. Uh, oh, you said it. Yeah, so, you can't always not be wrong. I'm not actually saying everyone needs to strive for literally never being wrong. But one of the ways in which things get undercut is when your key messages are slightly wrong. So uh, people may not have the context of what you have to say, and you might find your manager repeats a key fact in a significant meeting or some other context where you're not present. So my case study for why that's important is that context. So you're often not gonna be there when the decision's made and you're relying on someone else's presentation of the facts. So if you give them something that, under, that, that someone else can undercut, you've undercut your position quite significantly. So yeah, m many, many minor, minor inaccuracies, but don't assume that people will just get the point. Make sure your key messaging is factually accurate. Could you elaborate on don't leave the manager in apology mode? Are you referring to yourself being apologetic or are you referring to putting the manager in an uncomfortable slash apologetic position? Uh, well, look, so first of all, in general, general in life, apology is a very powerful thing and I'm all for it. What I really mean is your manager's time, your manager is one of your lead advocates. You want them spending their time on uh, arguing your case rather than uh, apologising for something that went wrong or a factual inaccuracy. So if they're in apology mode there, I meant that in a, a defensive scenario where something has actually gone wrong rather than the good version of apologising, which should be done. Um, so if you uh, either don't deliver on something you said you'd deliver, were wrong about something important, um, or anything of that nature where your manager has to go, I'm sorry for their... Uh, behaviour, inaccuracy, time spent, lack of availability, etc. You know, you've got to understand how your decisions are going to impact 
those people around you and some of the problems that that could create for your manager um, because they're actually one of the more powerful voices you've got, even if it's a very occasional thing. Uh, they're the ones in, this, in the more senior meetings. They're the ones in the other forums that you're not going to be in. They probably, probably reach further into more differing parts of the organisation. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time, but uh, I'm sure Tennessee will come and answer questions for you. Generally, pretty approachable kind of person. <laughs> uh, we will be back in about 10 minutes with the panel. And just so you know, the panel's not going to be recorded. So if you do want to see it, you do have to see it live. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We've got about 10 minutes. <laughs>